We are in session 17 today. We will continue with system dot collections namespace. Uh, in this session, we will cover system dot the collections dot bit array. What is a bit array? How can we use it? Uh, dictionary entry. What is it, and how can we use it? As well as we'll see a system dot runtime dot serialization overview. What it stands for, and how can we use it? And also, we'll see an I serializable interface within the system dot runtime dot serialization and we will also see ID serialization callback what it is and what is the significance using that and we'll see a hash table in detail we'll see what is a stack we'll see what is a queue and with this uh, we will co cover most of the system dot collections namespace in this uh, class okay let's kick off the session 17 now Uh, bit array. So this is one of the next, um, uh, I wouldn't say this is going to be that much frequently used uh, collection class, um, but uh, it could be very rarely used, but whenever the need comes, uh, it's going to be very handy. So bit array, as it says, um, the it's going to have an array of uh, bits. Uh, if you remember, we did talk about the bit, uh, what is a bit, and you already know what is a bit. Uh, in terms of the data types, uh, in terms of the memory that is uh, used. So bit stands for 0 or 1 in single and uh, you know the 8 bits um, will uh, will translate to a byte. So this array uh, is going to be a very lightweight array when you really have a scenario wherein um, you need to have a large number of uh, Boolean values uh, into an array. Uh, it could be any scenario, but that's, that kind of scenario is going to be very rare, but uh, whenever you uh, come to a situation where you need to have a large number of uh, Boolean operation, uh, Boolean values to store and perform a Boolean operation on all those uh, uh, values, then the bit array is very, very handy. Otherwise, without bit array, it's going to be a very lengthy and um, complex code that you might have to write. Uh, imagine like you have a true, false, true, false, true, false, and you have to perform an um, um, ban uh, bitwise operation on these. Uh, so you, you would normally put uh, okay true and true and true swans, so right? It's going to be very lengthy code. So instead of that, if you uh, use a bit array, it's going to be very straightforward. So uh, it can have a it can store uh, array of bits into that and perform uh, the bitwise operations. Uh, like in this case, uh, we have uh, uh, <coughs> the end operate. Uh, you can perform the end operation. You, ha you can perform the negation, not operation, uh, or operation, and also exclusive or. And uh, these are the operators uh, we did uh, cover in the previous sessions too. Uh, just to give you, a, uh, uh, I think this is again. Uh, I don't think any any one of you don't know what is end or or. Um, so I don't want to elaborate on that. Uh, but uh, things like uh, uh, not, if we, if, we see, if we see the not, for example, in a in a in the bit array, if you have all, uh, if you have false, uh, one of the item is a false, then the not operation will actually make it negation of uh, the given value, which is uh, going to be if it is true, then it will be false, and, and at the same time, if it is false, then it will be true. So it's going to be actually flip flop. Uh, it's going to be flip the value. Um, uh, that's called the negation operation, or in other words, not. And uh, exclusive or is again a, a, a very uh, useful one whenever you want to do a, a short-handed um, um, operation on the or's. So like if, uh, for example, or I uh, mean to say, uh, if you have a true or true, the result is true, right? So if any one of the value in the uh, operands is uh, is false, then the result is false. So if it finds one of the value as a false, then the result is going to be of uh, false, so it will. If you have hundred uh, um, uh, bits in an array, and if one of them is false, then it's the result is going to be false. So exclusive or is going to be uh, very f uh, faster in that kind of scenarios. And uh, ye yes, the various uh, interfaces that the uh, bit array implements are these three. Number one is the uh, clonable. We did talk about the what is a clonable interface. Uh, this provides the uh, clone member. Uh, it's a method that is available for 
to implement so that uh, the the uh, uh, when you are making a copy of uh, uh, your bit array or uh, if you want to do any special kind of operations on the copy then you can have the implementation uh, implemented for the clone method so that the uh, copy of a bit array from one copy one copy to another copy uh, will be easy <coughs> or flexible or customizable Similarly, I enumerable we have seen several times. Uh, when we use this, uh, we can use it for each loop or for each statement on the I enumerable. Okay, and also uh, it implements the I collection, which is the um, uh, base thing. Otherwise, the, this bit array wouldn't be a collection, right? So it has the and, uh, add, remove, and all those operations which we saw in the previous uh, um, slides. Okay, so uh, and uh, yes, another important thing here to note um, versus uh, other um, uh, classes here is the bit array is a sealed class. So hope you remember what does it mean by sealed. Uh, I'm not sure how many of you remember uh, what is sealed. Um, a sealed uh, when you when you make a class as a sealed, that means it is finalized. In VB.NET, it is finalized. That means this class cannot be further inherited by anyone. So this is final. So you cannot have a custom class inheriting bit array and implement its own. So it's, this is final. This is a finalized class. That's a key thing, a key difference between the other classes like the uh, array list that we saw in the previous um, session. Okay, so uh, that's kind of an overview of the bit array and we will uh, jump into the code. So in this case, uh, we have a so bit array is a class and we make use of that class and of course this is in the systems.collections namespace and uh, in order to make use of this, you have to uh, um, import in VB.NET and using in C Sharp uh, with the namespace called system.collections. And then this code will be successful. So, okay, bit array is the same way we uh, create a, an instance of a bit array uh, as we do normally. Uh, hope you're clear with how do we create an instance of it and what is this variable called. So, it's pretty straightforward. Um, and uh, once we have the bit array, we actually having it size is defined as part of the uh, uh, creation itself. Uh, so in this case, uh, it has a size of 10. That means it holds 10 bits or 10 boolean values within it. And the uh, we're trying to print out the length and count of this array immediately. And also we want to see the values um, of the uh, bits directly. So it, by default, uh, if you see, if you create a bool, uh, boolean data type, by default, the default value for the uh, boolean uh, variable will be false. So, and the same thing will happen here. Since we haven't passed any, <coughs> okay, so the same thing will happen here. This is the default, uh, it's going to take care of the default value here. So, in this case, it's going to be uh, false for all the 10 bits. In the second case, uh, we have an, a second parameter that you can pass in when you create a variable, uh, when you create this uh, uh, bit array instance, uh, wherein you can pass the default value when you create it. So you can uh, initialize all of these uh, bit arrays with a true um, in this case. Okay, and of course, uh, since this is a collection, uh, this, since this implements I collection, you can of course iterate through the items and also uh, update their values accordingly. Um, so, and also there are a couple of more uh, constructors uh, for bit array. You can actually make, uh, uh, take a look at uh, with the MSDN and C. There are a couple of more interesting uh, uh, constructors uh, wherein you can make use of the bit array more efficiently. And similarly, uh, in VB.NET, it's the same thing because since the bit array falls under the system.collection namespace, that means which is the base class library. So the same bit array is available in VB.NET also. So this name wise or um, doesn't make any difference. Only the syntax wise, uh, VB.NET has a different syntax than C sharp. Otherwise, everything is available uh, just like uh, it is available in C sharp. 
So here in this case we create the instance using the dim statement and variable name and as a new um, again and giving the uh, bit array as a class name. And here we are using the same code where we initializing the bit array using 10 uh, uh, capacity wherein it has 10 uh, bits or 10 booleans. Okay. So, um, so and in this in the in the other case uh, we have um, uh, bit array initialized with 25 element, uh, 25 bits and initialized with true okay and the output for this code is going to be this way so it's going to be uh, self explanatory in the first case as i as we discussed uh, when we have 10 elements created in the array and all of them got initialized with the false okay so that's what that's a default uh, value of a boolean in the second case, we have uh, explicitly initialized all of them in uh, using uh, true, and hence we see everything true. Okay, so it's a pretty straightforward one, and uh, immediately we can go quickly jump into a demo and see the uh, code uh, in action. Right. Okay, so there's the same piece of code in uh, C sharp uh, we have seen, and uh, here it's a uh, bit array with 10 and bit array 25 with true. So I'm taking this simple example, and there are more uh, constructors available as I, as I said. If I, if I open bracket, there are six uh, overloaded constructors here available. So one of them, or two of them, we have used. There are still four of four others. Uh, in this case, you can pass another bit array. If you see this, in, uh, um, this version of the constructor takes a bit array, so you can pass another bit array as a constructor. So when you do this, it's pretty much uh, becomes like a copy constructor. If you remember, we did a copy constructor demo when we, when we talked about the constructors. Right? This is an alternative way of achieving the copy constructor, uh, which is again directly not supported in C sharp or VB.NET. Uh, which is uh, which is uh, supported in C C plus plus. So in C uh, sharp, C sharp, uh, this is the alternative to achieve the copy constructor. Okay, and um, yeah, so this is an array of uh, booleans you can pass. You can have a local array, and you can pass that array into make it a bit, uh, bit array. So you can walk through these. Um, um, different uh, flavors of the constructor. How we can create it? Uh, it's going to be more useful. Down the line, and okay, uh, and the, how are we reading these values? Um, it is pretty pretty much using the for each, and remember this print values is again the standard one um, for all my uh, all the classes we are talking about because all of the collection classes we see in system dot collection implement i enumerable, and we did talk about the i enumerable in detail when we talked about the for each statement, right? So I hope. You all understand what does it mean? I don't want to go back there again unless you think it needed. And uh, yes, so for each we are using uh, since um, um, okay, all the elements are uh, we are reading them as an object and trying to print them out. And this is uh, this is a kind of a special uh, for each loop. And uh, in this case, what we're trying to do is uh, we are actually uh, pa taking a with as a parameter. What we, uh, okay, so let, let me go back and uh, show you how the output is. So it's a little um, um, okay. In this case, if we see uh, the output that is shown here, was actually uh, having uh, five values in a row. If you see, normally when you do a print statement, uh, if all the values will uh, Sit uh, one on top of the other, right? In a single uh, in a single column. In this case, we have actually printed the uh, output um, with the five uh, values per row. So it's kind of a you know table kind of a display. So how this is done is using the uh, a kind of an additional logic using this logic. This logic is actually trying to iterate um, iterate for five. Based on the width, okay, so because I gave five here, so that's the width uh, is used here. So till the uh, when the f uh, when the fifth element is reached, we are actually using a right line here. So when you do a right line, so it's a new line is added up. 
Okay, I hope you have noticed it or not um, so far. Console dot there is a, there are two things here. So one is the right. Okay, for writing there is one is a right, another one is a right line. So the difference between these two is uh, one will add a new line character at the end of the line, the other one don't. Okay, so that's a difference uh, between the right and right line. And similarly, you have a read. So there are multiple uh, like a read key, a read line, and read, especially here. So the read uh, read is going to um, read the uh, the character strings when you input, and read line is going to uh, take the values when uh, you have a lengthy uh, strings. You can actually give the uh, give a good try and try to see the differences between them. It will be interesting. So here, uh, that's what uh, highlighted here with the right line and right. So the right line, we are adding a new line when we reach the max width, okay? And so we are trying to decrement it, and uh, because uh, we get the max width, like in this case five, so five we are decrementing it so that uh, once the i value is reached zero, we are actually adding a new line and printing directly. So using a right, so right won't give you any um, new line character. So that's how we are actually getting the, okay, right, let me run it and uh, show you. Okay, so this is the output that we are seeing, right? And uh, how it is happening? So uh, when you do a right line, that means uh, when it reaches the five, we actually have a new line character uh, written. And uh, when, um, when the right is uh, written, so it's actually putting the, that value there, so it's actually Again, if you notice, there is a lot of space between each or each value, right? So this space is added up with a special formatter here. Uh, in this case, this is the formatter. This is the 10 uh, character space uh, that is added up using this formatter. So far, we have seen only a single placeholder, right, uh, within the curly bracelets. And in this case, uh, we are actually exploring more of the format uh, uh, formats that you can put in the string. So in this case, there are, we are actually having the value in the zeroth position and also the space we are adding as a 10. Okay, so there are more, uh, there are so many other forms uh, you can actually do the formats. Uh, string dot format we have used only one way actually, one of the very simplest way we have used so far uh, is with the curly bracelets and uh, giving a placeholder like 0, 1, 2 and so on. Uh, so this is another form wherein you can ma make use of it, and uh, and uh, in the real time usage of uh, that stringer format is really going to be very useful. Uh, for example, if you have a date time format, right? If you have a, uh, for example, you have a, a dd slash mm slash yyyy format. If you want to do this way, you can make use of the stringer format the same way. So wherein you can actually have the DDMMYY as a, a different thing. So you can actually Google out or you can even see in MSDN or folks around, uh, you will see how you can do uh, different types of formattings using the string dot format. Okay. And similarly, uh, this is one of the case we are trying to explore today. Okay. Uh, yes, yeah, so hope you're clear. So this is a kind of a special print values method explicitly uh, only for this bit array. So remaining all will again go back with the same old fashion. Uh, since this has a large number of values uh, to have a, a good count of the values, uh, I thought this is a, a better way to show up. Okay, good. So hope you're good uh, with this and uh, we have all uh, the bit array covered and this is uh, straightforward no complication about it, right? Okay, so next comes the uh, dictionary entry. So dictionary entry um, uh, is one of a very uh, fundamental, um, uh, um, it's not actually a class, I wouldn't say, it's actually a structure. So it's actually a structure, so in this case, uh, we have seen what is a structure and what is a class. Again, if you uh, really uh, have a, a doubt in your mind what is a structure and class, uh, I will recap again. Um, the structures are similar to classes except that the structures are value type, whereas the classes are reference type. And the main difference is that um, 
um, the classes can be part of the inheritance hierarchy or object oriented programming. You can uh, do inheritance using classes but not using structures. Okay, so the usage wise uh, uh, structures are useful to handle small amount of uh, uh, data. Whereas if you have a class, uh, if you have a scenario wherein you have to handle a large amount of uh, data, then it's always recommended to go with the class because structure is a value type and uh, class is a reference type. So reference type has more uh, power than the value types. Okay, and uh, yes, if the structures and classes can have uh, all uh, similar things, uh, even structures can implement interfaces too. In which case, uh, structures will be uh, boxed to uh, value type at runtime. So it's not recommended to do that unless it is necessary. And uh, a class, of course, can inherit another class and also implement interfaces, uh, whereas uh, structures cannot inherit uh, other classes since they are value types. Right? Okay, those are, those are the couple of uh, very good differences between them. And if you think you need to brush it up, uh, please do that. That's a very fundamental um, area people will expect you to know. Okay, so coming back to the dictionary entry. So this is one of the practical usage of a dictionary. In our examples, uh, we did use a structure uh, to represent a coordinates, uh, like an X and Y coordinate. And in this case, uh, the dictionary entry, uh, it is a key value pair. So in this case, um, it's it just has two properties. One is a key, another one is a value. So we did uh, cover uh, the dictionary class in the previous session. Uh, wherein it takes a key and value pair and also it has an iDictionary interface that it got implemented, right? So, um, so dictionary uh, entry is a structure uh, which holds uh, a key and value. Okay, how it is useful, we will see immediately in, when we talk about the hash table. Okay, so if you remember uh, we did cover uh, about what is a key and value pair and how it is going to be useful in the real-time world uh, real-time applications. So this is one of the typical, typical example that I have here. Uh, like in the real-time scenario, if we have a, a department table um, which has a, a key and value. So in the real world, uh, if you see uh, most of the master data or the reference data. So if you remember the keywords, that's, that will be helpful. Uh, so the master data usually are the, are the data elements that are likely uh, to be in the database and uh, subject to not to change so frequently. So these are the values like for example if you say uh, days of a week so they never, they're not, never going to change so the, if you want to have uh, days of a week like a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday so on and months uh, in a year. So these are the values that uh, can never change but they have uh, a key and value right so month one is Jan so so on and in this case uh, department uh, department uh, table for example so departments in an organization are not subject to change every day right so they might change <clears throat> but uh, the change rate is going to be very minimal so such kind of uh, data are stored or saved or placed in a special location uh, uh, which is called as a master data some refer to it as a reference data why it is stored separately is part of the uh, normalization process uh, when we do the database design. So if you already know what is the normalization of a database, uh, then it's good. You can understand why it is separated. So that's part of the uh, normalization uh, on for the first normal form. We have a second normal form and third normal form. It's part of the uh, second and third normal forms. Uh, the, uh, the recommendation is to split these um, uh, such kind of uh, data elements as a separate um, store. So so that's a little background of how these key and value uh, or dictionary entry going to be useful when you really do a big program. So, and this is one of the really a useful um, um, structure associated with the other classes uh, in a real time scenario. Okay, so in this case department has a department ID and department name. So that's what the ID is 100 and the name is accounts and in this case 200, 300 are two different other department numbers. So the dictionary entry uh, as a one structure, uh, this is a structure so it has only a key and value. So if you want to hold 
n number of key and values, then you will have an array of uh, dictionary entry. So as simple as that. Okay. So this is a kind of a demo. So if you see, uh, in this case, I'm using the array list to hold array of uh, dictionary entries. Okay, this is just a, a replica of how the dictionary works, right? The dictionary also takes a key and value pair. And in this case, um, we are making use of the dictionary entry class, a structure uh, to represent um, an uh, array, of, um, uh, array of key and value pairs. Okay, so and when you when we read them out, it's a special thing here. So that's the key difference here is that uh, of course dictionary also has a key and value properties. Uh, dictionary entry has the oops. Mm -hmm. yes. So the the dictionary entry class has a key and value. So this is as simple as that. So this is going to be very useful to use in this case when I create an instance of uh, the dictionary class, uh, dictionary structure. We're actually passing the key and value directly because it has a parameterized constructor that takes these two values. Okay, and we are reading them out uh, using the um, uh, dictionary entries uh, key and value properties. Okay, so hope that's clear. And uh, so the output of this uh, is very simple. So if we see um, uh, it outputs in the before we initialize, it has zero and false false. And uh, yeah, when we do the um, code, so the capacity. Uh, the key thing here is the if you if you uh, check the capacity, the capacity is eight and the count is seven. So if you see, but I have only seven elements within it. So uh, the typical behavior of uh, an array list, we did not notice it in the previous thing, but the typical behavior of an array list is that the capacity is going to be increased uh, whenever, uh, increased automatically uh, whenever there is a need to resize the array list, right? So we are not actually doing automatically. So we, it's actually done impl uh, internally. So every time when it uh, creates the, uh, increases the capacity, it's going to increase by eight. Uh, so first, whenever the 8 is done, it's going to increase to uh, next, uh, when you add uh, 8 or 9th element, it's going to increase to 16th, uh, the capacity is going to increase. So that's the internal, um, it's going to be done, so we don't really have to care about it, okay? Yes, so um, so the output is pretty straightforward, it's a key and value, wherein I'm just taking the uh, uh, weekdays here, for as an example, um, uh, wherein I am having Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and the key as a weekday number, and it's pretty simple, right? And we'll see this quick demo. Um, so we did the bit array. So bit array is already there in uh, VB dot net implementation. We did see in the slide. It's the same code. I don't want to run again. You can actually try it out if you're interested too. Okay, so the dictionary entry. So this is a pretty simple structure. So uh, let us see whether it's a structure or not, if I doubt, right? How I know, just go. And of course, yes, it is a structure, right? If you see, it is a structure. Right. So that's the definition from the metadata. So this information is from the uh, metadata of dictionary entry. Okay, so it confirms that this is a structure. And of course, it has only two methods, uh, two pro uh, properties here, uh, which which are of uh, uh, key and value. So that's a very simple thing, right? And it uh, actually uh, takes a, a value of type object. So that's the key thing. So uh, you know, we know that object is the uh, is the mother of all the uh, data types in uh, in uh, .NET. So it can it can pretty much actually take uh, any uh, data type uh, as a key and value. It need not be an integer. It can be your custom class. It can be your uh, string. It can be an integer or anything. Okay. So that's uh, one thing uh, that we wanted to cover. 
Okay, so uh, pretty much uh, we are good and uh, here um, it's the same core, it's pretty much add. We're adding uh, dictionary entries to it as a key and value pair and um, reading the values out. Okay, hope this is uh, straightforward. Um, and the only difference in the print values is that, uh, of course, still it is IA enumerable. The signature did not change from previous because all of these uh, implement IA enumerable. Okay, so that's uh, one uh, good uh, IA enumerable because it is a uh, uh, error list. So we are holding the array of uh, dictionary entries inside an array list. Okay, cool. So if you have any questions at this point, uh, feel free to drop a line. We can cover that. And yes, let's go ahead with the next topic. Um, yes, uh, before we jump into the next topic, so there is a subtopic here uh, which just popped up. Uh, this is a very, very interesting and useful topic and uh, I would uh, request your attention at this point if some of you are not attentive. Uh, so the serialization and deserialization is one of the very key important uh, concept in um, programming and especially in, uh, it's, it's not specific to uh, .NET, Gen it's a general topic um, and we'll see uh, how it is done in, uh, in the .NET also. So when we do a serialization of this object, we actually can persist this object to a flat file. Flat file means any flat file. If you have a notepad and created a, created a file, in this case, uh, that file is a flat file. Uh, that is, if you don't, if you're not, if you're not clear, uh, that's one of the format uh, uh, in which a file exists, and a couple of systems rely on the that file format. And, uh, and also an XML. So an XML is a flat file again and a CSV is a flat file. Uh, for the folks who really don't know what all what I'm talking about, if I, uh, for example here, I have a notepad, I say hello world, right? This is a simple thing and I say save and I will go to, uh, okay, desktop and say, uh, yeah, say data, say my data dot txt, right? I saved it. Good. So when I go and uh, see my desktop, I have this file. So this file is nothing but a flat file. Okay, flat means flat. So this file um, can be of any format, right? This is the txt file, plain txt file, and this can be dot xml file, or it can be a PPT file, PPTX file, so a file which exists physically on your disk, okay, is a flat file. You refer to it as a flat file, okay. And in this case, for as of just for the sake of example, I just put these two formats, like an XML or that. Uh, in other words, as I mentioned, it can be of any format. Uh, what we're trying to come to is uh, the object is actually in the memory, right? So it is in the heap allocation. Uh, to persist that heap to a flat file so that you can uh, use it at a, at a later time, uh, you want to persist that into a some format so that you can uh, recreate that object at a given time from the flat file again. Okay, uh, so take a typical example. Um, typical usage wise in a real time world, say your application is running and uh, all of a sudden something happened, your your system is go, going to crash or your application got terminated abruptly by someone, okay? And of course, before you terminate, uh, even today's uh, Windows operating systems are very smart, before the crash happens, uh, it's actually going to try to dump your session and take the machine to rest, right? And when you restart a couple of applications, they will prompt up and say, do you want to recover? I, I, I see that your application got crashed in the, in the previous instance. And now, do you want to recover from the previous uh, 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 session for them? So that's one of the typical cases. So how do you do that is the question, right? So in memory, so in this previous example, um, 
Okay, so my, I have my array list and uh, at this point, right, print properties and print values. When it, it came to print values, uh, say system got crashed. Okay, and uh, uh, I don't want to, per I want to persist uh, the values that are loaded at, uh, since these are hard coded values, it doesn't really make a big difference here. What if the, uh, the values are inputted by the user on a screen? You enter the values on the screen and put the submit there and say you have an input of some 50 fields. You don't want to retype again. Of course, it's a big pain uh, for anyone to re-enter all those values, right? And you try to post it and the transaction somehow got uh, jammed or struck somewhere and it didn't happen. And you close the application to go ahead. But soon after when you log in again and, uh, and the system alerts you saying uh, the previous session that you are trying to post did not save. Do you want to go continue? and show the values that users have entered as of that time, how good is that? So that's, that's kind of a user friendliness, right? So it's uh, user will be definitely happy because all the transactions got failed, you have notification saying the transaction has failed and, and, this, and add on to that is that you are actually giving him the values that he typed in so far uh, and wherever. So all he just need to do is, okay, submit again. That's it. So it's a very use, user friendly application. So how that is made possible using the serialization. Okay, so serialization again, so, so these values that are in memory at that point of time, we are actually going to save it to a, some uh, media. Uh, in this typical example, I am giving a, a media as a flat file. You can do it as a flat file, as an XML or that file that can save it in the local hard disk or you can actually transform that into another stream of uh, file stream and save it at the server side um, as a large object. It can be a binary as well. You can make it as a binary also. All it takes is take the values that end the memory at that given point of time and persist to a permanent store. It could be on a database side, it could be on a hard disk flat file or anything. So. There are various ways you can actually do this serialization and it's completely customizable and we'll see uh, the benefit of these uh, I serializable and ID serialization callbacks uh, interfaces. Okay, so that's the one way is a serialization process wherein the uh, memory, uh, the, the objects in the memory are persisted to a flat file or a permanent store. And the, the reverse process is called a deserialization. Definitely. So we, when you want to restore that back, you're actually creating these object, um, object or objects from the, uh, from the physical store. Okay, so, and continuing the work. So how do you do that? You do that using the deserialization. Okay, so that's, I hope you understood what, what I tried to cover so far, right? So it's the same uh, theory here. So serialization is the process of converting an object or a graph of objects. That means a graph of objects uh, means the array of objects or objects talking to other objects. So we did see the graph when we did talk about the uh, garbage collection. So wherein uh, one object is referring to another object and another object is referring to another object or you might have a containment relationship between two objects and so on. So it can actually process the whole set of objects which are related to each other which is re referred to as a graph of objects. I'm actually reading this line, okay? So, so it, it can be a, a single object or a graph of objects into a linear sequence of bytes. So this is, a, remember, when is a linear sequence of, sequence of bytes, it, is, it means that you can convert that into a binary file. So once you have the binary content, you can actually uh, write it into any format of your choice. And uh, there are certain formatters as well, which we'll see down the line. And uh, uh, either uh, for either storage or transmission. So this is another key thing here. We did uh, uh, talk about the storage part, right? And we did not talk about the transmission. When you talk about the transmission, uh, it means that you uh, uh, transform the the, uh, the object in the memory. Uh, into an XML file or any other file format. In this case, it can, it can be in Java terms, it can be a JSON format, it can be an XML format, or it can be a SOAP message, or it can be a HTTP uh, message, or so on. It can, it can be HTML as well. So any format of your choice. 
and transfer or transmit that content uh, via internet to another media. So this is the typical usage when you do your services. Uh, when you do the uh, when you when we come to WCF is again uh, is out of scope for our training session. But yeah, um, when you do the services uh, uh, services in general communicate messages from one service to another uh, other service using a transport layer in the between. So usually the uh, transport layer uh, could be a TCP/IP protocol or a HTTP uh, for internet use. Uh, so the transport need to have the uh, junks in the uh, in, in a given format. So usually uh, you, in, in uh, WCF is an XML based um, uh, services. You can also have uh, uh, other formats as well like a JSON for Java based services. Um, so so on. So let's not go too deep into that concept, uh, that area. So you can, uh, so what uh, we're trying to come to is whenever there is an uh, object in memory uh, that could be serialized into a transmittable format so that it, you can transmit that content via the wire. Okay, so that's where the serialization comes into play. So um, given the definition of what is a serialization, you can actually rationalize uh, how important that topic is, right? So it's a very, very important topic and it's uh, uh, whenever someone says uh, you, want, you need to serialize it, you need to just understand what does it mean. So people, um, so just uh, memorize uh, what does it mean. It's pretty much uh, persisting the um, the objects in the memory to a, a physical store or a transmittable format, okay, to another location. So this uh, this serialization is the reverse of that. So transforming the uh, the content in the binary format or in a physical store into a objects. So in this case, when you, when your system crashes, what you can do is you can just serialize all the objects in the memory and put it somewhere where you can retrieve it when you do a recovery. So whenever you do a recovery, what you're going to do is you're going to take all these ob uh, persisted uh, uh, serialized content back to the given objects and show the users the values that they are um, um, lost when things have failed. And the I serializable interface is one other thing. So, so that's the topic here. We're talking. We're going to talk about uh, the I serializable interface. Okay. So when you say someone go and serialize, right? Uh, it can serialize straight away. So uh, if you have a class, for example, in the previous session, I have a person as a class which has an ID and name, right? You can straight away serialize it. As simple as that, you can straight away serialize it. And how do you do that? Um, I'll tell you. Uh, probably sometime down the line with a couple of other examples. Uh, probably it will be very useful when we really talk about uh, the web-based applications, wherein you want to put your uh, object into a session, right? A session is a again it can be a, a different store. It can be a, in a database or it can be a in proc session of a server. So if you want to put this object into a session, so what it needs to be doing is it needs to be serializable. So how it is serializable? It's very simple. All you need to do is decorate the class with this serializable attribute. Oops. So this is, we, we did uh, see this kind of attributes. These are additional attributes that you can decorate a class, right? If you may, if you decorate your class saying it is serializable, that's all you need to do. And uh, when you say um, session dot add and pass the instance of this class object, it is going to do it for yourself. Uh, you don't have to really write any special code to transform uh, each and every item into a, a different store. It's going to do it for you. Okay, so that's as simple as that. But it's not going to be uh, sufficient in uh, in every case. So wherever you really want to uh, have a custom hold on what need to be written and how need to be how it need to be written, in those cases for a, a additional handle, you're going to make use of the I serializable interface. Okay, so this is the interface that we are. Oops, I, have, I want to have a straight line. Make it straight. 
Yes, that's right. Okay, so this is the interface. The iSerializer interface will help you to customize uh, how to serialize the content. Okay, and of course, uh, as I've been saying, you have a different formats in which you can uh, uh, persist your objects. So all those formats are available in in this namespace, which is oops, 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 oops. Okay, again, straight line, please. Okay, so this is the namespace that again you need to um, remember. And also remember, we actually jumped away out of system dot collections. We actually uh, had a uh, D route here out of system dot collections. There is a reason why. Uh, we actually went into system uh, dot runtime dot serialization. Okay, so that's one thing that you need to remember because a serialization is again uh, used used in all of your collections, but the serialization uh, interfaces itself are not from uh, system dot collection because a serialization can be uh, done at a, uh, at a uh, at an object level, so it is at a different root altogether. That's why it's, it's classified into a runtime. So remember the namespace usage, the usage of a namespace itself uh, is a logical grouping of a related class or interfaces. So that's how the iSerializable is not under system.collections. So because it is not specific to system.collection, but it is specific to um, many other things at a global level. So that's why it falls under the runtime uh, as a namespace. Okay, that's again an important thing to remember. And uh, yes, yeah, so um, yeah, class in this uh, formatters namespace control the actual formatting of various data types encapsulated in the serialized object. So you, it's you can have a different format uh, you can use, and also the formatters are also can be customized again. So everything is customizable. So whenever it is an interface and whenever it is an abstract member remember that they are extendable or scalable. In other words, they can be customizable. Okay? Okay, the, and any class that might be uh, serialized, so that, that might be serialized, must be marked with a serializable attribute. So this is an example, right? Uh, in this case, if we go quickly, go back and uh, see, uh, so they can error list be serializable. Okay, let us see. I'm going to the error list, go to definition, I'm into the um, metadata of error list. So where is my attributes here? Do I see the attributes? Yes. So error list is already decorated with serializable attribute. That means an error list can be serialized by using a default serialization. And also you can actually write your own attributes. Okay, so we are actually deviating from our topic. Uh, so we are talking about the customizations, right? So it's all about the same thing. Uh, so serializable and of course, um, if a class needs to control its uh, serialization process, it can implement a serializable interface. And what an iSerializable interface has, it has get object data method. There is only one method. So what happens here is whenever you say uh, you use the respective serialization uh, mechanism, uh, wherein in this, for example, you want to persist, uh, you want to persist the object into a session in a .NET uh, ASP.NET session, uh, which can be in database or it can be an in proc session. Uh, then you need to actually have an engine that. Uh, does that for you. So the respective engine, whenever you say uh, persist this, it's going to look up for get object data method. So, uh, so the get object data method is actually implemented by default in this attribute. Whenever it says serializable, that means it has a default implementation of get object data internally. When by implementing I serializable interface explicitly, what you're trying to do is you're actually trying to override that base behavior, okay? And provide your own definition of how to serialize it. So that's a get object data method. Um, and similarly, when we do a deserialization, 
uh, we use the ID serialization callback. In this case, it has a uh, one method called on deserialization, right? So you have persisted the object uh, into the uh, flat file or into the database, and when you're reconstructing the object back, uh, you want to do some kind of, uh, for example, uh, for example, if you're doing a financial system or a simple calculator, right? If you do, if you're uh, okay, calculator is not a good example. If you say for a retail system, for example, a retail system, you actually scan ten items to bill. And uh, uh, the 10 items, uh, before you uh, finish the transaction, you just scan those 10 items and the system got crashed and the system successfully actually uh, persisted the transaction up to that point. Okay, when, when the system got restored, it's, it's going to show you back the um, 10 scanned items. Okay, but these 10 scanned items were uh, objects, right? And that you have actually retrieved them successfully by using a deserialization. But when you did the deserialization, you were able to recover the objects, but you cannot actually save the, you were not able to save the total. For example, the bill total is actually calculated amount that is shown on the screen, but that calculated amount is not saved anywhere. It's not part of any object, right? So that calculated amount you want to do, then you will uh, take this route. So wherein, you will say on deserialization, whenever you deserialize the 10 scanned objects, you are also going to do the totaling and show the total on the screen. So that's the flexibility here. This is going to be useful going forward uh, in the forthcoming topics. The topic is hash tables. Okay, so hope you're clear what is an I serializable and I deserialization callback. Right, so now we are jumping into the hash table. The reason that I covered those two because hash table uses them. Okay. Okay. So here's the hash table. So hash table is again a member of the system dot collections namespace, and it is a kind of a dictionary. Again, if you see, it is a key value pair. And the speciality of hash table is that um, the keys, uh, the keys that you pass in, are going to be um, um, uh, are saved and also searched whenever you search for those values based on the hash value, hash hash key value of the value of that object. So if you remember uh, what is an uh, hash, that's why the name itself goes as a hash table. If you uh, if you remember the uh, the earlier uh, topics that we talked about uh, as an object, for example, in this case, the get hash object, for example, I make an object, obj is equal to new, okay, object, right? So I'm just created an object. So this is, you know, what is an object, right? Object is again, of course, instance of a class, but the object here itself is a what is it a class or it is a class right so it is a class which is the root class so all the data types in the dotnet are actually coming out of this object because that means the mother of all um, uh, data types in dotnet is objects okay um, so what the reason why I came here is to show you the get hash code Okay, so this is a member available uh, in the object itself. That means all the data types that we have in .NET will have the method called get hash code. So what the what the what does this do is it's trying to give you the a unique value. Um, it it will actually try to give you uh, in it's it is a not a safe way to rely on the get hash code. But although in most of the scenarios it is uh, it is good to use, if you have uh, ten different values uh, in array and uh, you want to um, uh, identify them uniquely, uh, then uh, you can have duplicates, of course. But still, you want to uh, like for example, uh, you have uh, um, the man in a cave. Oh, okay, that's a bad example. Um, I would say have a man keyword repeated twice or thrice 
in your uh, string of arrays. So they are duplicate values. But if you want to identify them as a unique value, so each of them you can actually have a uh, make a call of a get hash code. So get hash code will be unique at a given time. Uh, but again, uh, as I said, it is not uh, going to be guaranteed to be unique and that's the reason uh, it is virtual. So when it is virtual, uh, you know what it means? I hope most of you do. Uh, I've been repeating this on almost every session whenever there is a chance so that uh, whoever uh, don't remember it, they can refresh it. So whenever you make your uh, members virtual, that means they can be overridden by the derived members. That means if I have a custom class, um, if I have a person class, you don't have to actually explicitly inherit from object. That's the key thing to know. So you don't have to say, okay, inherit from object. It is implicitly done. Okay, so even if you do a custom class, it is implicitly going to uh, derive from object. Okay, uh, how can you make, how can you be sure? Really, you can, if you have a doubt, uh, you're very well to raise, I can show you how um, uh, at the end of the session, right? Uh, it's, there are ways to see uh, if you create a class and uh, see where it is rooting from. You will see definitely you will be surprised to see that it is actually rooting out again from object. So all the data types in the .NET will come out of object. Uh, okay, so if you see the int, int also will have a get hash code. So that's the point I wanted to like to say. So get hash code is a special case here, uh, which hash table is going to make use of it extensively. Okay. We are resuming back. So that's the base difference between the other dictionary and the hash table. Otherwise, this also has a key value pair. The advantage with that is that um, it and uh, the searching mechanism um, of lookup mechanism uh, into hash table is far more efficient than uh, the dictionaries. So we'll see more of those performance things uh, uh, when we talk about hash table. Uh, there are more uh, that we need to look into. Okay, so here uh, this is one of the interface that it implements a hash table is the I dictionary. We have seen uh, I dictionary when we talked about the dictionary, right? And uh, uh, also it has uh, the same set of uh, methods. Of course, if you remember, what is this? This is an indexer, right? We did talk about what is an indexer in the last uh, session. Okay, so I indexer is there and also it implements from uh, I collection, I enumerable for, for each, I serializable, which we just saw, to persist the um, class uh, at runtime. It implements the I serializable and also it implements the I deserialization. Of course, definitely whenever you do I serializable, you definitely will go with I deserialization also because you customized uh, how to serialize them in the first place. So whenever you deserialize it, you definitely want to do uh, the same approach how you did in I serializable. Otherwise, they might be mismatched, right? And the last one is I clonable. So if you see, there are almost six hands coming out of hash table. So it is more, more, more bigger than our array list or dictionary. The additions to this is the two things. One is I serializable and I deserialization callback. So those are the two additional uh, interfaces that uh, added up to hash table. And those two are from system.runtime.serialization. And that's the reason we did cover the, those two before we get into this. Okay. And uh, quickly we jump into the uh, demo. Although, uh, although um, technically it is so complex, uh, usage wise it is not at all a complex. It is going to be as, as easy as uh, a array or as easy as a uh, array list or, or dictionary or uh, bit array or whatever. Uh, so it is going to be very, uh, very simple. It's the same way actually, it's not about simple. It's the same way you can add a key value pair, you really don't need to bother how it is done internally uh, because everything is out of shelf. You can just um, remove from the shelf and open the pack and use it, that's it. 
Okay, so this is a hash table uh, code. So usage wise, there is no difference as I mentioned. And yes, uh, okay, uh, we'll go step by step, not to jump. Okay, so here I'm actually adding uh, to the hash table. I just created the uh, variable of type hash table that is creating an instance of this hash table class and um, adding the values using the add method and the add is special right because it is taking two parameters if you see um, yeah so add is taking two values one is key another one is value and both are of type object right okay so that's what I wanted to show and a uh, oh, key thing is that another thing is uh, reading the values out uh, we are reading this values out uh, using the same um, thing so the surprisingly we are actually reading that as a dictionary entry so if you see we have covered what is the dictionary entry so dictionary entry is a structure not a class it's a structure with the key and value properties so when I'm adding a values um, to my hash table it is actually storing these two values as a dictionary entries in the collection isn't it same to what I have done in the this demo in this case I just had an array list and actually created instance of dictionary entries to the list right and if I compare to hash table it is actually do although syntactically I'm just adding a key and value internally it is actually storing as a dictionary entry because I'm using the same data type to look up into the list that is provided and I'm reading out okay so that's an interesting topic here internally it is maintaining a dictionary entry now that's the reason I covered the dictionary entry uh, although it's a structure okay so uh, that's the speciality of a hash table it's going to maintain that as a uh, again the, the main important thing is that it's going to use the uh, hash code of each of those key values so when I'm passing one two three four five it's actually going to use the hash code of this um, value rather than the value itself so that's a major difference I'll show you the difference uh, even in the output also how it's going to come back since it makes use of the hash code okay and uh, hash code is more efficient uh, if, uh, so if, if I do this way using an array list and do this way this is not going to be an efficient way because uh, array list is uh, not going to be using uh, uh, making is going to make use of the values and you cannot actually sort these entries uh, if you make this as a dictionary and uh, lookup is also going to be expensive because it's going to look up as a value but not as a an hash code whereas a hash table lookup is more efficient um, we'll see that okay so here I'm adding the Sunday to uh, Saturday as a values and I'm just trying to print them out right I'm just printing up using the same for each loop using the dictionary entry and we can have a breakpoint here and uh, run this code okay cool so the add part is done and we are into the for each if you see it matches the uh, dictionary entry and uh, if you see the locals uh, it's again my list if you see this part here so this will explain self explain uh, obgde is a data there are dictionary entry right so this is of type dictionary entry so that means all the values that I passed as a are using the add method all of them were actually saved inside the uh, hash table as a dictionary entry so this is a key thing to remember okay so now I'm reading because it's a dictionary entry it has a key and value properties and using them I'm reading the values out okay it's clear and I'm going to say f i or continue running and the output output is little surprising if you see 
Okay, output is a little surprising and uh, you will see what is the difference, right? In this case, when I added the values, I added as a 1, 2, 3, 4 in ascending order. But when I printed them out, they actually came back as a descending order. So that's the, again, the difference if you see uh, versus, the, uh, versus using an array list uh, and adding the dictionary entries as an array elements versus using the hash table. So a hash table make use of the hash code internally and the hash code value is used to sort uh, the values by default. So it's actually sorting them by default uh, because by sorting and making them uh, in an uh, order, uh, it's ensuring that your lookup mechanism is going to be faster. Uh, if you remember, um, uh, of course, if you have uh, gone through the how the lookup mechanism works, even in database search, uh, uh, search if you have a column and your column has an index, the search is going to be much faster than the uh, without an index column, right? So it's a similar way. Um, a hash table is going to make use of the hash code algorithm to um, do a lookup much faster. To demonstrate that difference, if you see, uh, I'm going to add an uh, intermediate value. Okay, I'm going to have an intermediate value. Say I have values up to 700. I'm going to say 9. Okay, let's see if it is going to pre-sort it. Okay, although I added them in a different order, it is actually going to pre-sort pre them. Okay, if you see the 9 came on the top because it's actually pre-sorted that using the hash code. So whenever you do a lookup, it's going to be more uh, faster. So that's the advantage of a uh, hash, tab hash table. So imagine if you have a large, um, large number of uh, uh, values that you want to handle. At that situation, you you really need to consider which one you want to make use it. Okay, and uh, definitely if you write a code for a thousand. Uh, key value pair values uh, using an array list and having a dictionary entry the way I showed you the other way Definitely that's not going to be efficient It's going to eat up a lot of memory and also it's not going to be efficient so If you make use of the hash code uh, hash table, it's going to be much much efficient Okay, so here uh, the prints okay as, a, as we discussed uh, the dictionary entry is a key thing to see that the internally It's actually saving those values as a dictionary entry and the same code in vb.net. So it's the same uh, hash code available in vb.net, oh, sorry, hash table available in vb.net, and it's the same way we're going to make use of it, using the add method, excuse me. And the, uh, when you do, when you read them out, we're using making use of the for each syntax, okay? Um, another thing uh, that I want to uh, really highlight uh, the reason why I'm showing uh, both the codes on side by side it is really important because um, a couple of exams right exam a uh, couple of exams uh, will actually try to confuse you uh, saying uh, for each uh, if for example the exam is an C sharp exam or a VB dot an exam in mostly C sharp exam right if you take a, uh, they will say they will list out a couple of options saying uh, for each like this all uh, small case and also they will show you uh, for each like this okay with the uh, vb dot net syntax and also they will show you uh, for each in a different way so they might uh, give you a different uh, other options so um, it's important to uh, to be aware that what is that exam you're giving and uh, w what is valid in what okay in as a simple note you you already know c sharp is a case sensitive and uh, all the keywords are small small case so in vb.net it's just opposite to it so vb.net all the keywords are capitalized so they're going to be starting with the capital key capital letter and continue and also there will be a break between the keywords whereas in um, uh, C sharp there won't be any breaks in between like in this case for each doesn't have a uh, space whereas for each and vb dot has a space and also for each starts with next whereas uh, for each doesn't have anything called next so they, those are the uh, basic 
um, differences uh, language wise so um, of course I even I get confused uh, whenever if I uh, start writing C sharp for two days and the third day if I have to write a VB.NET program I will start writing C sharp code in VB.NET so definitely uh, that, that's the human nature um, we, uh, switching from one language to another language so especially uh, of course if I do that, that, that there's no harm because a compiler is going to crib saying oh you're doing something wrong so I can immediately correct my thing but if it is an exam if you choose a wrong arm, wrong answer then that's it it's gone right so there's no correction mechanism there okay so just wanted to give you a heads up on that and yes this is an output we have seen and the demo we did see uh, well in advance okay the hash table there are a couple of characteristics of a hash table okay we'll see one of by one so since we see the hash table what it is how it looks like how we can make use of it and how does it look like uh, at runtime so now we understand what these statements that we have here okay so the first statement uh, says that each element is a key value pair stored in a dictionary entry table we did see that yeah a key cannot be null reference or nothing in vb.net so here it is uh, kind of uh, not null constraint so a uh, hash table although it is uh, a memory collection it is pretty much like a database table so that's the reason if you see the name of uh, this collection goes with a hash which is hash code because it relies on the hash code and the next is the table okay it's a database table so it's actually the name by name itself uh, you, you can actually know the uh, behavior of it okay so that's a good thing that you can remember what is a hash table right so by the word table uh, we can say that this is more or less like a table like a database table not just a collection because it has an internal lookup um, uh, mechanism which can uh, pre-sort them like a clustered index uh, the clustered index if you know in the database uh, it's going to actually whenever you add values to it it's going to store those values physically in the sorted order so that the the lookup is going to be much faster so hash table does that we have seen that uh, no matter which order you put it's going to store them in a sorted order so that the lookup is faster okay that's number one and number two that the key value because if you have a primary key column uh, the primary key column in the database uh, if you have a null this it doesn't make any sense so the primary key itself is a not null and unique so in this case the key uh, that you're passing in should not be a null this is a not null constraint enforced here uh, because uh, if you have a depart can you have a department without a department ID so that means the department you use the department ID elsewhere uh, elsewhere everywhere right so uh, and you refer the name from this table because that's why it's a reference table and uh, if you don't have an ID and get the value that doesn't make sense so that's why you must have an ID uh, to really make use of uh, the name so that's why uh, key is uh, not uh, it shouldn't be a null it is a, not an optional value it, it is a mandatory and another thing is the the next top next uh, topic is uh, on next uh, characteristics is the objects used as keys by a hash table are required to override the object dot get hash code if you remember if you uh, when this says objects that means um, all the objects uh, that are predefined right the predefined like the integer or uh, boolean or other things have they have the um, the objects implementation because they directly inherit from uh, not inherit they actually uh, rooted out from the object uh, class itself but if you have a customized class and you want to make use of that customized class uh, as as a key or a value especially as a key not a value uh, because the key is going to make use of the hash code the, the, you must implement the uh, because the get hash code is a virtual method you must override uh, the uh, get hash code and provide your custom implementation so that you make it unique okay or you can actually implement the i hash code provider interface 
okay and uh, either way so either you uh, override this method or you implement the i hash code provider interface so both are uh, either way same because within the i hash code provider it has a method called get hash code uh, which will be implemented and the object dot equals method need to be again uh, overrided or i comparer if you remember we did cover the i comparer interface wherein this interface has a one only one method called compare so you're going to make use uh, so internally when the hash table is trying to look up for values or compare two different uh, uh, hash tables it's going to make use of the uh, uh, this methods uh, dot equals uh, method to check if the uh, both the arrays are same or not and also using I compare or interface and implementing the compare method you can actually custom, uh, provide your custom implementation or how you can um, compare both the values right okay and the key objects uh, the key objects whichever the passing as a key as a, a key and value must be immutable beginning so immutable means they cannot be changeable so who cannot be changeable the value types cannot be changeable right the reference types can be changeable when you say changeable means in a specific context right um, like uh, a variable x and variable y are referring to each other if the value of x is changed then the value of y automatically changes that is uh, mutable behavior which happens in the reference types whereas in value types uh, even those are uh, assigned to each other only the value will be copied but not the reference so uh, the value that you uh, assign to one of the variable will not be reflected in the other variable so that's the immutable so the value types are immutable and whereas the uh, reference types are mutable right so the key objects must be immutable as long as they are used as keys in the hash table so if you're making use of a keys that means you must be having a unique they must be immutable guess why uh, okay the keys if you're having uh, 100 200 300 so they need to be fixed right so they cannot be dependent on someone else if someone else uh, if for example it is if it is immutable and the value gets changed uh, because of some action happened in the, somewhere in the program then it could be disastrous right so these are supposed to be a uh, keys which need to be same throughout the life of the program so they cannot be changed every time so for example if you say um, 100 is refers to a in the previous example um, yeah, we have a department 100 as accounts department and if, if uh, in the first place it is 100 and accounts and some point of the time if it changes to 200 and you're still trying to say it is accounts, no, it's not accounts because 200 is finance, right? So the, the meaning itself is going to change, so it cannot change. So that's why the keys whatever you provide need to be immutable, okay? So preferably you put any value types rather than a reference types when an element is added to the hash table the element is placed into a bucket based on the hash code of the key so that's what we uh, have covered it is going to make a check on based on the hash code of the key it's going to put it in the bucket so it's going to internally maintain a buckets uh, for handling these values and subsequent lookups of the key use the hash code of the key to search in only one particular bucket so it okay you understood what I'm saying what it means to say the substantially reducing the number of key comparisons required to find an element so that's what the search lookup uh, mechanism is going to be much efficient and the load factor so this is something called a load factor so when you're actually um, so let's read out the whole thing so the the load factor of the hash table determines the maximum ratio of elements uh, two buckets so it's going to maintain buckets based on the hash code uh, the identical hash codes will be put into one bucket so that whenever it's do the search it's going to reduce the search uh, uh, iterations uh, into the number of buckets the smaller load factors cause faster average lookup so if you have the uh, smaller load factors 
uh, look up the items in the cost of the increased in the memory consumption. So for example, the if you have the smaller, okay, so let's see the load factor ratio first. The default load factor ratio is 1 is to 0, or 1.0. So this is the default and that's the max value um, uh, the load factor can take. Uh, so if you put a smaller value, for example 0 0.1, that could be the smallest value. So if you put the smallest value, the uh, the, the, it's going to be faster, but it's going to be consuming a lot of memory. Uh, it's going to be consuming a lot of memory, or uh, in, in other words, the number of buckets that are going to be used are going to be smaller. In that case, more number of values we have and more number of buckets is going to be creating. In that case, it's going to be consuming a lot of memory, but it's going to be uh, comparatively faster. But if you have lesser number of buckets, that means um, this is going to consume less memory, but it's going to be considerably okay, but it's going to be not too faster, but it's, uh, it's the optimal way to handle is 1.0. So if you leave it the default value, it's the best thing to do. So it's going to be optimal. Okay, so, uh, so if you really um, want to see what is the load factor, we'll, I will show you again, okay? So the, that's one of the um, parameter that you can pass in uh, when you create the hash table. So these are a couple of methods uh, available, or properties available uh, for a hash table that you can make use of it. And so far we haven't actually uh, uh, seen how the contains work, right? So contains is not new to hash table. It is already there for the array list and other things also, right? Uh, so in this example, I'm trying to show you that. So here uh, in this line, I'm trying to show if we are looking uh, because we already have the values called one, two, seven, and we are trying to see if it if the collection contains one, or in the second case, collection contains a key two. It's a two different ways, right? You can also say contains one. That means it actually by default looks up into key. And also we can be specific to see uh, that if it contains key directly as two and uh, also uh, contains value. We can also search by value, contains value Friday. Okay, so uh, so that's why I, that's how I can do. So Friday, it's, of course, it is there and two, of course, it is there. One is, of course, it is there. So that's why the values uh, resulted to true, 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 right? And the next three cases are 10, there is no such value, 20, there is no such value, there is no such value called fry. So it returns false at the end, right? So, um, so for the first three, it actually written true, and the next three, it is actually false. Okay, and uh, this is the hash code. So this is the hash code for the entire, for the entire collection, for the hash table. Okay, so that's some number really. Um, it doesn't mean anything to me, or probably anything to. Me. Uh, for as a human, right? So it's probably internal number that is trying to make use of it to do the best it can do and it's uh, going to make use of it. Okay, hash table, um, yes, well, I wanted to show you the load factor, right? So in this case, uh, okay, this is the sample code and of course we already ran this program and uh, in the first instance, because uh, uh, contains one key and everything because at the first time when it's loaded, it doesn't have any of them. So all of them are um, false. And um, and of course, the hash code is uh, already predefined. If you see the hash code is there in the beginning of its uh, the array itself, it has its own hash code. If you see the uh, hash table instance itself has a hash code and that did not change, if you see although it has a values added up later stage. So this is the kind of a hash code that is available for every uh, instance, uh, every object in the system. And in the second case, we have added the values like, um, um, yeah, in this case I have a nine, of course, and Saturday, Sunday, whatever, the values and the numbers. And at 20, I don't have 20, so it written false. And fry, it, did not, it doesn't have fry in the value, and so it is false. And also 10, there is no such thing, and it is false. And of course, for Friday, there is Friday, that's why it is true. And also, for, there is a key called 2, 
uh, and it written true and there is a key called one and that's how it is written true. So this is how we can make use of the contains um, method. So this contains method is there in uh, hash, tab uh, hash table as well as in the array list as well as the dictionary and so on. So we can actually make use of it. Okay, um, stack. We have uh, heard about this keyword, right? Stack. When did we hear? When we talked about the memory uh, allocation of uh, value types, right? Yes. So when you talk about the memory allocation of uh, value types, we did talk about a stack. I am pretty sure that every one of you knows the data structures in computer programming and the stacks and queues uh, fall under that category. Um, if you know the basics of a stack operation, um, I just laid out the um, methods here which is, have, which is referred to as a pop and push. Okay, so before we go there, uh, we just uh, uh, I'll give you a quick overview. A stack is again a collection of values, right? It is again a collection, of course, and it implements uh, these three interfaces. Uh, number one is iClonable. It's the same thing. It's almost there with every uh, um, the col every collection class. And I enumerable, it's it's there. And I collection, which makes the um, your class as a collection, right? So I collection is a mandatory. So stack um, class has a special prop, uh, methods are called a push and pop. So what is the difference uh, with respect to others? Uh, when you do push and pop, and again, so stack as by fundamental, it is a LIFO. That means last in, first out. For example, you have a stack of books, for example. You're stacking one on top of the other, right? Uh, the bottom one is a book one, the top one is book two, book three, and so on. So if you want to, to retrieve the uh, book, you cannot actually retrieve from the bottom. You ha always have to retrieve from the top, right? So that's what this stack means. So whenever you have items on a stack, uh, on one on top of the other, you can actually place the last one and pick the last one first. So whenever you put the last one, you, you, that means you can add and remove the items only from one direction, that is from only from the top. So whenever you push, that means you're actually adding an item on top of the existing item. Okay? And uh, pop, whenever you say pop, pop doesn't take any parameter. So you, that means it doesn't take any index to retrieve at the given number. It actually always pops from the top. Okay? So that's the stack. Um, uh, behavior and the stack uh, collection also works the same way to uh, give the data structure behavior. So in this case if you see push, 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 all this push are actually adding one on top of the other. So first comes Sunday, okay, and Monday and Tuesday. If you see the values here, the output actually showing the Sunday at the bottom because that was the first thing went in and the Saturday became the topmost one. So if you see that's the uh, uh, push behavior, it's going to add one on top of the other. That means there is only one way uh, from the top to add items. There is no other way. You cannot actually insert uh, values at the middle or you can add values from the bottom. You cannot do it. You can, it will always add from the top. And the push will do that. And whenever you uh, pop what it is going to do. So this first pop, so first pop what it is doing, it is actually reading from the top, right? So that's first, since the um, the first one is uh, Saturday, when the first pop did appear, it actually got Saturday out. That means this is the last item that went in and that's the first item that came back. Right? So the last in first out and similarly the next immediately it got a Friday back. So it's going to read from top to bottom in the order. And at the end if you see the values available, the remaining values are from Thursday to Sunday. So this is a typical uh, uh, stack behavior. Okay, we'll quickly run the code. 
commented out and uh, stack. We are, want to do this stack. Okay. So this is the same output that we see. Um, okay. And unlike the array list or the hash table, the count, um, of course, uh, you know, the capacity, there's nothing called capacity here. Uh, it has only one property called count and uh, it shows the number of elements within it. Okay. Hope this is clear. So these are the special things. Uh, and of course, uh, the print values is again taking an enumerable because um, it implements i enumerable, right? Because it's an implements i enumerable, there is no problem in using the for each. And okay, so this is what we noticed that uh, the last object is removed first and demo is done. And queue, uh, queues are a little different. So queues are first in, first out. So whatever goes in first will come out first. So queue is uh, queue is uh, pretty much like a, um, a tube. If you say if, you, if it is a water tube, if you uh, pump water from one end, the water will come out on the other end, right? So that means whatever enters first will actually come out first. So that's ex exactly opposite uh, to what the stacks do. So stacks are pretty much like a container uh, without any outlet from the bottom. The outlet is only from the where you enter in. So the queues are um, just like a water pipe. So the, this is a uh, first in first out. To do this, um, there are two special methods here. One is NQ and DQ. So NQ will add, a, uh, add an item to the collection and the DQ will remove the item from the collection. Okay. So the code here, if you see, it's just like a stack except that this is a queue and it has an NQ adding Sundays and same values uh, and DQ. Let me just compare this properly. Yep. So if you see uh, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday is added. Uh, there is no order change here when the values are showed. The Sunday is still on the top and the Saturday is still at the bottom. Right? And when I pop, uh, when I pop actually uh, this is a uh, mistake, I should say DQ. Whenever I remove an item, so the the, uh, the um, so whenever I put the first as Sunday, the first Sunday itself is popped or dequeued out. So that means it is a first in, first out. So this is the one that go, went in first, and this is the one that came out first. This is a FIFO implementation, and similarly the following Monday, and the remaining items are the Tuesday to Saturday. So that's a typical um, uh, behavior of a queue. Okay, so we'll see that a quick demo and uh, okay, so this is the output of the queue. So same thing that we see Sunday uh, went in first and Sunday came out first. Okay, that's the first in, first out of a queue. Okay. So that's all and uh, we'll continue uh, in the remaining topics in the next session. Okay, session 17, we are continuing with the array list uh, as well here and we did see the bit arrays uh, in general uh, in system.collections namespace and how can we use and when can we use bit arrays uh, directory, uh, sorry, dictionary entry dictionary entry we did see and it's a key value pair and it's a structure that's available uh, out of box which we can use to handle the key value collections and we did see what the serialization in general how can we transform an object to a flat file or a dat file and how can we deserialize and what's the serialization in general and we did also see the I serializable interface and I deserialization callback uh, interfaces available in system.runtime.serialization namespace and uh, we did connect that whole serialization to system.collections namespace uh, wherein the hash table class has a 
iDictionary and also it has IC realizable and ID serialization callback implementations or, or uh, inheritance in general with the hash table and we did walk through the a very good demo with the hash table uh, and uh, we did walk through the characteristics of a hash table wherein the uh, hash algorithm is uh, used to used on the key values that's passed in uh, to sort them and we did see a very good demo of uh, 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 some of the key properties and methods of a hash table and we'll just see what is the stack in system.collections then space. Um, so lastly, we saw the queue implementation in uh, usage of queue in system.collections namespace in this session. And we'll continue with the sorted list in the subsequent uh, sessions. And for now, we'll take a break and uh, uh, watch for the next session uh, to continue with the next topics.